This is a chapter in the story of what the Quartermaster Corps is doing, night and day, to provide clothing and equipment which will increase the efficiency of the American jungle fighter. For the most extensive field study of its kind ever undertaken, a test area was chosen along the Gulf Coast of Florida, with a climate and terrain comparable to those found in the Southwest Pacific and the China-Burma-India theater. High humidities, dense forest and jungle, swamps and marshland, no Florida resort, this Gulf hammock country. More thunderstorms here than in any other part of the United States, and the highest summer rainfall. Plenty of insects, rodents, poisonous snakes. About all that was missing was the Jap. In this tough jungle area, a camp was set up at Indian Bay on the west coast of Florida, 60 miles north of Tampa. The Quartermaster Board of Camp Lee, Virginia was designated as the test agency, a group experienced in the techniques of field testing and the collection of scientific data. Their objective was to determine the basic needs of the jungle soldier and to establish the adequacy of test items. Each class of item was supervised by a specialist, experts in footwear, textiles, tentage, food, mobile and portable units, like this portable shower or this laundry. The enlisted men who comprised the test troops had to be tough. They were selected by means of two screening tests. The first was the Harvard Step, conducted under the supervision of a physiologist from the Harvard Fatigue Laboratory. These men were to engage in a series of 21-day problems involving an amphibious landing and a complete jungle operation under the most rigorous combat conditions. They had to be able to take it. Two hours later, the second test began, a four-mile forced march, a portion of the regular Army Ground Forces test of fitness. The idea was to complete the test as rapidly as possible, running or walking. At the end of the four miles, each man's time was recorded. The tests were conducted at a temperature of between 80 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. About 20% of the men tested did not qualify and were eliminated. Meanwhile, the test group was planning and organizing the entire study. One section, a control unit, scheduled the various problems and the distribution of the equipment to be tested within each problem. Another group, specialists in particular categories of items, concentrated on tests that would lead to findings in their specialty. During the tests, consideration was given to defects in equipment which had been reported by observers in combat areas. Through these investigations, the quartermaster board would be able to answer questions like, does the item do the job effectively, comfortably? How can our men have better protection against the unseen enemies, insects, mosquitoes, against deterioration of equipment in jungle climate? Before going out on each tactical problem, the men were given a medical examination. Particular attention was paid to foot condition. Medical officers were experienced in tropical maladies. Here the men are picking up the equipment they're going to work with in the jungle maneuvers. They've been carefully briefed on the items to be tested. They know the purpose of the equipment, the reason it was designed in a particular manner, and the information the test group is trying to arrive at. More than 300 separate items will be investigated. The most ambitious project in field testing ever undertaken by the Quartermaster Corps. Yes, these men knew just what they had to do and the reasons for doing it in a particular way. This made them feel they were an important part of the overall study. The men selected were rugged, well-disciplined, and were quick to learn the essentials of infantry jungle tactics. This platoon is going out on a problem devised by returned veterans of the South Pacific. It will be as realistic as possible in respect to terrain, tactics, and the physical rigors jungle fighters must undergo. Those shoes, uniforms, everything is going to get a real workout. First came the amphibious landing. 
The initial objective was to establish a beachhead on Pine Island. The troops came in just as if they were debarking from landing craft. Practical knowledge of the Pacific veterans was utilized not only to simulate actual combat conditions, but to correlate those conditions with the problems devised by the test group. For example, one of the purposes of this amphibious operation was to determine the comparative effects of salt water on different kinds of materials, fabrics, metals, and plastics. Other tests would establish the water uptake of various items, the amount of added weight after immersion, and the time required to dry them out. They'd be tested for fit, comfort, durability. These men are wearing expendable plastic waders, which were found unsatisfactory for amphibious landings in the tropics. Findings would be made on eight different kinds of fabrics, herringbone twill, nylon, bird cloth, joe cloth, poplin, and so on. In short, while every effort was made to achieve tactical realism, the primary purpose of the amphibious landing was to test the equipment and not the men. The number on this man's helmet is important. It's his identification on the master chart back at headquarters. This master chart shows the complete variety of equipment being used during each problem and the specific troops engaged in that problem. The soldier's test number is keyed to his individual measurements in clothing, footwear, and headgear. During all phases of the operations, observers from the test group were on hand to question the troops, examine the equipment, and record their findings. They slept with their platoons, wore the same uniforms, ate the same food. They constantly studied the living habits of the troops in relation to their equipment, turned in detailed reports every day. A great deal was learned in this way about what the average soldier thinks of his equipment and what he can improvise and construct with only those items which are issued to him and which he can carry with him. An operational base was set up for each 21-day problem. The early phases were used to acclimate the troops, to train them in jungle living and give them experience in the use of equipment, like this 18-inch machete, which was recommended as an essential item of equipment. Or this entrencing tool, which can be used either as a pick or a shovel when digging foxholes. Of the several types tested, the hickory handle, two-coat finish entrenching shovel was the most satisfactory. Jungle sleeping equipment was tested. Among the items was a foxhole bed net, which helps to keep a man off the ground, and can be used as a hammock, cot cover, sniper's roost, and litter. This standard jungle hammock, one of four types tested, was typical of the thoroughness with which all items were investigated. The hammock was tested for durability, protection against mosquitoes, increase in weight when rain soaked, it was also analyzed for mildew growth and the effects of repellents on the hammock's plastic coating. The standard nylon model with certain recommended modifications was preferred. This device helps to keep the rifle from picking up dirt and mud. Also tested was a quick zipper release. This feature enables a man to get out of the hammock quickly and easily when necessary. The problem of storage dumps was studied to see where and how tropical deterioration occurred and to discover what conditions and methods would afford the maximum protection for supplies. Items like this roller conveyor were tested with its gravity feed system. Various types of dumps were set up, some on the beachhead exposed to sand and salt spray, Others in the jungle where the effects of high humidities and torrential rainfall could be analyzed. Proper and improper methods of storing supplies were determined. Rough handling can cause deterioration to set in later during storage.
Closely bound up with the question of storage was that of emergency rations, C, K, D, and 10 in 1. In studying rations, three general methods were employed. First, records were kept of the total amount consumed. Second, the soldiers were asked their opinion as to the acceptability of what they ate, and a record was kept of those items that were not consumed. Third, they were given a free choice of different types of rations. At fixed intervals, a luxury meal was provided. After it, the men returned to standard rations more readily. Changes were recommended in various components and the methods of issue of the emergency rations tested with a view to providing better consumption through greater variety. In studying different fabrics for use in jungle clothing, the test group sought to find out how the various types were affected by impregnation against vesicant gases. Studies were made to determine the efficiency of a field impregnating set, which could be handled by relatively inexperienced personnel in any situation. While this set fulfills its purpose for field impregnation of clothing, it was rated as unsatisfactory with regard to soldier transport and time required to process clothing in the field. Tests were made of nylon and nylon-filled poplin uniforms, as well as cotton fabric. The garments were squeezed by hand in the solution and wrung out in order to work the impregnite into the fabric. Then they were hung up to dry. Studies were made of the durability of the fabric after impregnation, skin irritation caused by impregnated clothing, and discomfort arising from heat, stickiness, and odor. How to protect jungle soldiers from mosquitoes was one of the most important objectives of the field study. Elaborate controlled tests were conducted. This medical officer is counting the bites as part of one such test, during which troops deliberately exposed themselves for recording purposes. Other tests involved the effectiveness of mosquito repellents. Several types were used, including liquid repellents, which were found more suitable than the paste repellent. The impregnation of garments by dipping and spraying with dimethyl phthalate was also tested. Dipping was more effective, but even that retained its effectiveness for only two nights. Best protection against mosquitoes for extended periods was afforded by untreated, lightweight, closely woven fabrics. A complete weather station was maintained at the base camp. In the field, smaller stations equipped with instruments for measuring rainfall, temperature, humidity, and wind speed gave continuous data for each hour of the day and night. Before all jungle patrols, platoon leaders reviewed the tactical problem and the chief reasons why certain equipment had been scheduled for a test. There were routine daylight patrols, overnight patrols, and extended four-day patrols. This is typical of the conditions to which the men and their equipment were exposed. They plowed through swamps like this for hours. Sometimes they had to take a break standing up in mud and water. Thorny vines and sawtooth grass subjected uniforms and equipment to severe strains. Footwear was also thoroughly tested in the swampy terrain. The problem of crossing streams in the jungle occurs frequently. Weapons must be kept dry. In this case, the waterproof rifle cover the soldier is carrying did not need to be used. But sometimes it's necessary to swim a stream, and then both the rifle cover and flotation bladders, which are blown up and placed inside the jacket, are very helpful. Between the rifle cover and the bladders, this man and his equipment will get across without any trouble. After immersion, the rifle is still dry. Flotation bladders were recommended for issue in areas where the terrain requires frequent stream crossing. Often it was necessary to improvise. Waterproof clothing bags, when blown up, gave this raft extra buoyancy in carrying a heavy load across a stream. The waterproof bags will keep the water out all right, but they can't keep the air in indefinitely. Notice how the raft is beginning to submerge a little as the bags collapse. Since the men often were located beyond the reach of normal means of supply, 
it was sometimes necessary to free drop from the air. After delivery, the cases and their contents were examined and their condition was recorded. On other occasions, the parachute drop was employed. The parapacks are canvas containers with a removable harness and shock absorbers. The results of dropping supplies on varying terrains were recorded. Sandy soil, rocky soil, swamps. Exhaustive tests were held on the efficiency of different kinds of packs. Here the officer in charge is giving instructions on the items that will constitute the pack load. When the men understood the purposes of the test, the packs were made up. The observers, as usual, recorded their data during all phases of the test. This type is a haversack with horseshoe roll. Here observers are taking measurements of girth and the weight of the pack. There was a close check to see that the packs were fixed correctly and to record the locations of the items within. One test was to determine how much water uptake resulted from immersion. Notice that the jungle packs are buoyant. This lowers the resistance when troops are bucking a strong current. Afterward, the packs were weighed to determine how much of an extra load they had picked up. Here the men are double timing to see how the packs ride, whether they bounce or sway, and if the straps cut into the shoulders. In the crawling test, observers watched the position of the packs to see if they interfered with balance. The need for a pack constructed in two sections, one for combat and one for cargo, was apparent. Modifications including watertight closures, simplified attachments, and improved balance were recommended. When the men hit the dirt, that pack had to be on just right, or else this happened. This was the way it should have been. All the pack test findings were recorded. When the situation permitted, the men used springs and streams for bathing and laundering their clothes. Here, an all-purpose soap is being used to wash out a pair of socks. It can be used in either soft or hard water, or even seawater and it will give a satisfactory lather for shaving. So the testing went, down to the smallest items. As each 21-day problem was completed, the men broke camp, filling up foxholes and policing the area in general before returning to the main base at Indian Bay. They were a pretty tired outfit after three weeks of broiling sun, muck, rain, and emergency rations. During each tactical problem, the men had been completely isolated from the base camp. They had been living under field conditions without comfort or conveniences of any kind. They did a good job on a tough assignment. And their equipment had been given a real workout too. It was turned into the test group, who inspected it thoroughly and recorded all visible signs of deterioration and failure on analysis sheets. This technique of statistical analysis and other established techniques led to findings which were used as the basis for a final report on the field study. On the basis of these observations, it was found that the most suitable uniform for use in the tropics should be constructed of a lightweight, closely woven fabric for coolness, quick drying qualities, reduced payload and mosquito protection. Bird cloth, nylon filled poplin, joe cloth and poplin met these requirements in the order named. Every item was inspected and charted, right down the line, like this improved cartridge belt, which was recommended. In all cases, locations and types of failures were noted. Three general types of footwear were tried out. The jungle boot, the combat boot, and the service shoe with leggings. Of the three, a jungle boot type with built-in arch support rubber cleated soles and nylon uppers was found most satisfactory with regard to traction and comfort when wet or dry. The men were given a thorough medical checkup to see how they had come through three weeks in the jungle. This was not merely a health measure but also served to record physical changes, if any, 
resulting from the use of test items and rations. The next step in the final phases of the field study was to question the men on their reactions to the equipment they had used. The objective data, like measurements and weights, could be evaluated in terms of statistics. But it was also important to get the actual physical impressions that the test troops had gathered while using the equipment. So they were given an opportunity to air their views, to criticize those items which they had found uncomfortable and awkward, to voice a preference as between different models of the same piece of equipment, and to suggest modifications which they felt would be an improvement. Spot alterations of items based on the opinions of the test subjects, observers, and the control group made it possible for all modified items to be tested in the field. Selected for the next tactical problem are these typical modified items. A mosquito sock with a semi-rigid sole. A jungle boot with inner sleeve to prevent mud penetration. And a lightweight jacket with drawstring sleeve closure and a stitched gas flap at the front closure. Before going out on the next patrol, the troops were allowed to choose certain items of equipment which they themselves considered most adequate in respect to comfort and efficiency. In some of these items, modifications had already been made according to their own suggestions. While certain standard models of rifles and clothing were mandatory, other items like machetes and blankets were left to individual preference. For example, they had a choice between a plastic machete sheath that was rigid and one that was flexible. Also a canvas type, both flexible and semi-rigid. There were several kinds of ponchos that they could choose from, including the synthetic resin-coated type and one made of nylon, which because of its light weight was recommended. There were different kinds of canteens, among them collapsible one and two quart canteens. This type is hung on the cartridge belt. And this one is slung across the shoulder. For individual use, this stainless steel canteen was found most satisfactory. This one is a plastic model. And these are different types of mosquito socks one of which has a semi-rigid sole to afford the wearer protection when it is worn as a rest shoe. When they had been thoroughly briefed on the qualities of the different items, they were allowed to choose what they themselves considered the best payload. In fact, throughout the field study, in all its aspects, free choice was permitted as often as possible, on the assumption that the soldier who had to use the equipment could help in determining its good qualities and its faults. With their choices made in the modified items and with a payload of their own selection, the troops went out into the jungle again to test the equipment further. When the field study was completed and the entire accumulation of data had been analyzed, a proposed table of equipment for the infantry jungle soldier was recommended. In addition, a table of organization and equipment for a provisional test group was prepared as a guide for use in similar large-scale field tests to be conducted in the future by the Quartermaster Corps or other technical services. At Camp Indian Bay, the Quartermaster Corps established procedures and techniques which are helping to provide the American soldier with the clothing and equipment he needs to survive and to win.